So I was watching a video the other day and the creator suggested that every time you do a project that you should try something new. And as I was watching the video, I thought to myself, that's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Why do I think that's not a good idea? Well, simply put, if you are trying something new every project you make, then you are in a constant state of experimentation. You are never going to be efficient and optimal with your workflow because you're constantly experimenting with something new. So if you have a number of projects to make or you just need to build something quickly, experimenting is not the way to go. However, there is a time and place for experimenting. So certainly if you are a full-time content creator and you're constantly looking for something new and you want to help educate, experimenting is the way to go. Secondarily, if you want to learn something new, feel free to experiment. I would tell you that I needed to make this crosscut sled. I have projects that need it. I needed it quickly. And yet, somehow, I chose to experiment. I experimented on a lot of different facets of this sled. The result of all of my experimentation is that I learned a lot of lessons. And so this video is about all the things that I screwed up and I did poorly and I did suboptimally making my ultimate crosscut sled. So if you're here hoping to get a tutorial on how to make an ultimate crosscut sled, this video is not for you. This video is for someone who wants to avoid making dumb mistakes like I did when they made their ultimate crosscut sled. All right, so let's go ahead and let's jump into the video and let's run through around seven major areas that I would say you need to consider if you want to make your own sled and do it well the first time. All right, before we jump into the things that I screwed up while making the sled, I do want to talk about the sled very quickly and some of the features because I think it's important to set the stage for uh, why I chose this design, how I made it, and why some of the mistakes I made were partially my fault and some of them were just maybe confluence of events. So this crosscut sled, I used plans from Casey Reeves. I purchased it from his website. Uh, Tamara at 3x3 has a similar design. They actually collaborated on these plans and so I think they split their plans in two. What attracted me to this crosscut sled, there were two major things that really attracted me to it. First and foremost, it's a little embarrassing, but I like the color. I like the red and the black. I thought it was super sexy, it was eye candy, it was something unique, it was something that stood out, and it really drew me into those specific plans. But what really sealed the deal for me is this 45 degree on the side here, which I actually haven't cut yet, but there's a 45 degree on the side here that allows me to cut 45 degree angles with a little bit of alignment on the side and not a lot of additional work. Now I've been cutting big chamfers on cutting boards for a while now and doing them on the table saw is a little sketchy. It takes time to set up, it takes time to configure the saw properly and the results are not always perfect. And so when I saw the 45 on the design, I was like, that is the cross cut sled that I want for me. And so that sealed the deal. I went out, I purchased the plans and then I acquired all the parts and I set off to build it. And so that is what leads us into my first major mistake. So the first major mistake I made started really before the project even began and I was about five minutes in and I chose to use some bolt of birch that I had left over from a previous project from the laser table project which I will link above and down below if you're interested in that. Now this wood I knew was not three quarters of an inch, but I figured it was close enough for the purposes that I need here. The last time I created a cross cut sled, I committed to myself that I would use Baltic birch because it is just a higher quality of wood and it really produces a better outcome than the wood that I used last time. In this case, the Baltic birch that I had was 14 millimeters and I thought no big deal, 14, 18, you know, 220, 221, whatever it takes. Well, <laughs> that is just simply not the case. As it turns out, when you subtract a 3 eighths of an inch thickness from 14 millimeters worth of Baltic birch, what you end up with is a surface that is super thin and not thick enough to screw into. So what that means is the T-track that I needed to route into it, the wood was not thick enough to screw it down. 
Now, I could have just epoxied it, but I've learned in the past that epoxy doesn't necessarily hold the T-Track in place as firmly as maybe you would want if you're going to lock some things down. So screws and epoxy are the better choice. And so I thought, well, okay, I have a little extra of this 14 millimeter plywood laying around, so let's just go ahead and double it up. So I spent about two hours gluing these fences together and doubling them up. It took me forever to get the boards aligned. I had to wait for them to dry. I actually waited overnight. And when I took everything out of the clamps, nothing was straight, nothing was parallel, and very few of the things were actually even flat. Now, one key feature of a cross cut sled that is really important is that this rear fence is completely flat. And I will get to that in a minute. But by doubling up the wood, I got the thickness that I needed, but I did not get the results that I needed in terms of it being flat on the bottoms and the sides. Now, I did try to joint the wood to make it a little bit flatter, and jointing plywood is not a very awesome experience, so I wouldn't recommend that. So I threw away all the parts that I made. I started over again with the plywood that you see here. Now, it turns out this plywood is not quite three quarters either. It's about 0.7 inches. And so what that means is these T-Track grooves are also a little more narrow than you would want. So what I ended up doing is taking some of these half inch screws and just grinding a little bit off of them so that they won't protrude through the bottom, which would be super not awesome in a cross cut sled. So at the end of the day, I ended up using the plywood that I did have on hand and it worked out, but I would certainly commit to myself or I should say recommit to myself that if I were to make another cross cut sled, I will just simply go buy 18 millimeter Baltic birch and call it a day and eat the cost. Um, that is a mistake that I made and it is a recommendation from me to you to just start with the materials you want and call it a day. So the second major mistake that I made was not so much a mistake, but I think it was a combination of the plans that I chose and my own inability to read. <laughs> and so what had happened is the plans that I purchased here from Casey have this little sliding wing, or it has the ability that this side of the Crosscut sled can slide back and forth so that you can uh, close the gap and recut the center if you need to. I thought that was a really cool feature and something that I wanted in the crosscut sled. Well, the first time that I made this rear fence, I laminated both sides of the inside of the fence, which made it stick out a little bit further than it should have, which meant this was not flat. So that was not optimal. Now, I will say, there was nothing indicating in the plans what should be laminated and what shouldn't be laminated, so that is one advice I would give to Casey to maybe just indicate uh, exactly what should be laminated. Had I read the plans more clearly and really thought through what I was doing, it would have occurred to me not to laminate uh, this side here, but I did, and it is what it is. So. As all good workers do, I chose to simply just plane the laminate off. I thought that'd be good enough. And of course it wasn't because I planed it a little bit too much, which now instead of sticking out, it was uh, too narrow and it was actually sunken in. <laughs> so I remade it again. I laminated it properly. I put it all together and it wasn't flat. It wasn't flat because when I glued the boards together, I didn't clamp it to anything, I just trusted that, that the plywood was flat. So what I had is a, another version of the rear fence here that simply wasn't flat. I did attempt to flatten it. It didn't work out. So what I ended up doing is making the third version of this rear fence. I made sure to clamp it to a level, made sure everything was flat, and I was good to go, or so I thought. It was flat before I laminated it. After I laminated it, it turns out that it was not flat. It actually, for some reason, had a high spot in the middle by almost a sixteenth of an inch end to end. And that's super not awesome. And it's something that I didn't discover until I started using the crosscut sled and I was cutting a cutting board and I couldn't figure out why the cutting board was, you know, too high on one end. And so I got out the the ruler, I tested it and indeed it had a high spot. So I did not want to make this rear fence for a fourth time. 
I just simply did not. Uh, first off, I didn't have enough T-Track left to do it. I did not have the patience nor the time to remake this fence. So what I chose to do is, with the planer, take just a little bit off of this fence to get the melamine down, and then I ran it through the drum sander to get it completely flat, took a little bit of snipe. And so I reattached it to the sled. I clamped a level to it while I was doing it to make sure it was flat and everything was lined up. And within about a four thousandths of an inch, this thing is flat. So I think that is good enough for my purposes. So I would say definitely lesson learned here is when you're gluing it up, certainly make sure that it's flat. If you choose to laminate it, make sure it is flat as well. Uh, I would maybe suggest not laminating the front to guarantee that the flatness is there throughout or taking a little bit more care with the laminating process to make sure that everything is nice and smooth and nice and flat. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in to the third area that didn't go so awesome for this build, and that is the lamination process itself. Now, at the end of the day, the laminating went just fine. I had never done it before, so in this case, it was an experiment. But uh, what I learned throughout the process is you need to be super careful of when you're putting the glue on the laminate to not get any glue on the reverse side. I was not terribly careful while I was doing the glue up and I did end up getting a lot of glue on the sled as well as these fences. And so the instructions say to take a little bit of uh, mineral spirits while it's still wet and wipe it down. Uh, I tried that, it didn't work, it must have already been dry. And so the instructions also say that once it's dry you need to uh, chip away the glue from the surface which essentially didn't work at all. Um, I still have some spots that have glue on it. I've been trying to scrape it with a variety of implements without destroying the, the laminate surface here, the melamine. You know, so it's not a big deal, but I just, if I were to do this again next time, I'll just take a lot more care and make sure that I'm not getting glue on the reverse side. And if I do, that I get it off as quickly as humanly possible. So that is my recommendation to you. I do like the fact that this is laminated. I like it is super slick. I like that I can clean it very easily. I like that black and this red combination again. Certainly you can choose any colors you want. Uh, so I would probably laminate the next one that I do. I would just take more care. The fourth area that I would say caused me problems is something that I wasn't expecting going into the project, but in hindsight makes perfect sense. And so about two years or so ago, I purchased some HDPE runners that I intended to make a new cross cut sled for my old table saw. Now I never got around to it. Uh, I didn't like that old cross cut sled. It was just too big, it was too heavy, it was too bulky. And so that's really when I started looking for plans for cross cut sleds to give me some inspiration. Well, I chose to use those HDPE runners here for this sled and they caused me all sorts of problems. Now, I would still probably use them in the future now that I know a little bit better on how to solve some of the issues, but uh, I would certainly say that Casey's recommendation of using the uh, Craig T-Track bars might be a better and more straightforward solution in the long run. So what problems did they give me? Well, first off the bat, the way to attach temporarily the runners to the sled is to use a little bit of super glue on them, push the sled down, then you pull the sled up, and then you permanently affix the runners. And so that actually worked the first time I did it on one side, but when I went to the other side, the glue had popped free. And so I was like, okay, no big deal. I put a little bit more glue down throughout the entire runners. I pushed it down, I held it there for longer than I did the first time. And then I pulled it out and the runner popped right off. <laughs> And so in hindsight, if you know anything about HDPE, it is a very slick surface. It is intentionally slick. Uh, you use it for epoxy and a variety of other things. And so what that means is the super glue just simply doesn't stick to it. And that is literally by design of HDPE. And it just never occurred to me that that would be the case whenever I started out with the process. And so I did end up ultimately getting the runner in place. I affixed both the front and the back and then I went to screw it down the center. And in the process, the runner was not straight so the sled wouldn't actually even get into this groove. I couldn't actually get it under the table saw. And so what I learned is HDPE is not only very slick, it is very flexible. And to get it perfectly straight is impossible without some sort of aid. So what I ended up doing is using a little bit of T-Track, 
clamping the T-Track to the runner, making sure that the runner was in the right place, and then screwing it down with that T-Track attached, and then testing it on the table saw, and everything went well. So my recommendation here is if you do choose to use HDPE, know that the super glue trick might not be the best way to go, and also know that you will need to attach something to it to make sure that it is perfectly straight. It will not remain perfectly straight unless you have something flat attached to it. So uh, that's a lesson learned for me. Again, I like the way that it slides with the, with the HDPE. So like I said, I might choose it again in the future. Uh, but certainly I would think those uh, Craig miter bars made out of aluminum would be a lot easier up front for someone who maybe has never done this before. The next area that I maybe did not perform so awesome in is something that I don't do very often and I actually kind of avoid it and that is routing these tracks into the sled base. So my fundamental mistake with routing this out is I did use something flat to run the router against but because again I don't do this very often I routinely probably 50% of the time get the direction of the router backwards from the direction that I need to move the router. And so you want to make sure that your router is always opposing or the spinning of your spindle is always opposing the direction you're moving so that you're doing a climb cut instead of a conventional cut. That means that the router will be pulling into the material and it will remain straight as opposed to the router pulling you along as you're doing the cut. Well, the very first one that I did over here, I got it backwards and I didn't do so awesome near the end there where the router literally pulled away from the uh, track that I had set up and I noticed it and I fixed it and I got a little better near the end, but it's not perfect. So for the second one here, I fixed that. So instead of pulling the router towards me, I pushed it away from me and it worked perfectly. The, the T-Track came out wonderfully. And when I got to the third one here, I said to myself, well, I didn't really like pushing it away from me because I couldn't see where the bit was going because I had the router turn around backwards. And so I figured, hey, you know what? Pulling it towards me is no big deal. I'm a big human being. I can fight this router. I can make sure that I get it straight. And I didn't. I did the same thing that I did in the first one. So... I screwed up. <laughs> it was completely my fault. I thought I was more awesome than a router, and I'm not. That's not because I don't route very often. It's because you're not supposed to do cuts like that unless you really, really are paying attention. And so I have two places on the third one here that have huge gaps in them. It was a super bummer because when you get these gaps, you have this white wood, you know, shining through your black top, and it just doesn't look very awesome. My advice is go ahead and always do a climb cut no matter what. Orient yourself in a direction that makes sense to do that climb cut. I very much could have just stood on this side of the sled instead of this side, but I didn't. Uh, secondarily, I uh, used dust collection. I failed to use dust collection, and so that was a huge mistake as well because I couldn't see what I was doing. And then the third thing I would just say is, you know, I fixed the mistake by coloring the wood black. So you can barely tell. If you're a few feet away, you wouldn't even notice. And unless you're me who did it, and I know, and everyone watching this video who knows what happened, uh, you might not even notice. I know, and so that's a bummer, and it's just something that I will do differently in the future, and I certainly recommend that you do that differently as well. So the next area that I want to say that I could have done better on in this kind of sixth mistake is something I alluded to earlier and that is reading the instructions kind of uh, cover to cover a couple times to really understand what they're trying to tell you to do. Now, I skimmed most of them. I looked at the pretty pictures and I saw pictures and dimensions and I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna start cutting with the dimensions, no big deal. Well, by not reading the instructions, I didn't fully understand how this sliding uh, wing mechanism really was intended to work. Because of that, I didn't necessarily get the T-tracks that were supposed to be in here and are on the front fence here really in the right location the first time, and so I had to fiddle around with it. And then I also, like I said earlier, I ended up laminating both sides of the slider, which meant that it was proud of the fence when it shouldn't be. And it could have been maybe a little bit more clear in the plans not to uh, laminate both sides, as I mentioned, but had I just taking the time to really read the instructions and read how the thing was assembled rather than just looking at the pictures and jumping right in. 
I think that it would have been better in the end. And so that's my own mistake, but it is a recommendation I make to you. If you choose any router plans or if you choose to make your own, really think through the assembly process and really read through the plans to make sure you really understand what is going together and why it's going together and how it's supposed to go together uh, so that you don't end up screwing up like I did. The seventh and last area that I made some mistakes in is an area that I committed the last time I made a crosscut sled not to screw up. And in fact, I actually purchased some specialized equipment for the sole purpose of making this crosscut sled, and then I didn't use it. <laughs> if you are familiar with crosscut sleds, you know the easiest way to tune it in is the five cut method. And if you're not familiar with that, um, I will leave a link to Jonathan Katz Moses' website. He has a good blog entry about how to do the five cut method, and he's got a five cut calculator that really simplifies the process of the math of figuring out how to tune your table sled. And so the five cut method simply is that you put a piece of wood on your table saw, you uh, cut it and rotate it, cut it and rotate it, cut it, rotate it, cut it and rotate it, and you end up with a piece that you measure the thickness or the width of the top and the bottom, and that tells you whether or not your fence is completely per perpendicular to your table saw blade. So to fix any misalignments here, what you need to do is you need to have a pivot point and then uh, the point at which you're screwing in on the opposite side. And the easiest way to make this adjustment, if you need to push your fence one way or the other, is to affix some sort of block where the router fence is, use a feeler gauge to uh, set the appropriate thickness based off the calculation, remove the feeler gauge, push the fence in the proper direction, and then re-affix it. That is the fastest way to dial in the fence, and that is exactly not what I did. <laughs> The very first time I had to adjust the fence, it was out about a millimeter, uh, 1.2 millimeters or so, and it had to go away from me. And I was like, hey, you know, this melamine's about a millimeter thick. I'll just push it forward until I can, you know, align it with my thumb and it'll be all good. So after adjusting the fence the first time, I reran all the cuts, and it turns out it wasn't quite perfectly aligned as well. And so I had to push the fence just a little bit forward. It was a 0.0 six, three inches it had to go forward. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll just eyeball this again. It worked out okay the first time. And I eyeballed it, I reran the cuts, and I didn't push it enough by about the same amount. Somehow, as I was affixing it, I was still out by about 0.063. And so I did that process four more times of eyeballing it and getting it not quite right. The eighth time, I bunked myself on the head and I remembered that I had the feeler gauges. And I remembered what every website and every video and every tutorial recommends on how to adjust this fence is to use the block, use the feeler gauge, and you will dial it in very quickly. And that is exactly what I did for the eighth try. <laughs> and so I got this fence within four thousandths of an inch parallel to or perpendicular to the saw blade, which is far more accurate than I think I would ever need in one shot. And so again, uh, my advice is when you're adjusting this fence, definitely use the five cut method, definitely check out Jonathan's blog and read it all the way to the end because at the end it literally says to use a feeler gauge and I didn't. And so here we are. I have a lot of lovely holes on the bottom side of this. So God help me if I ever need to adjust it again because I think I'm out of space. But nevertheless, here we are. Uh, we have a fully constructed cross-cut sled that I think will work out well. It is well-tuned and well-adjusted. And um, my recommendation to you is read the instructions, use the feeler gauge, and you're off to the races. Well, that was the video. I hope if you get the opportunity to make your own ultimate crosscut sled, you do choose the plans made from Casey or from Tamar. Uh, they are definitely worth the investment to start from something and then customize as you need. I will leave links to both of those down below. If you have any questions or comments, also please leave them down below. If you are interested in projects like this, maybe perhaps you will like this video right here, a recent project that I just completed. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired.